when did the dream of Janie's life-changing baked goods hey. come to pass? <laughs> when do you think you found yourself like, I have a problem with alcohol? Did anybody tell you? One of my second times drinking, it was in the West Village um, Halloween parade. And I was with like all of my guy friends from high school. Somehow we went to a, a Halloween party in like Bayside where like the guy was like, you can't bring alcohol into my parents' house. And everybody was like, that sucks. And I just remember being like, yeah, that sucks. Like only having drank once or twice and just, you know, wanting to be part of that crowd. So when did you find yourself drinking on a daily basis or weed or like, what was it yeah. that, that where you found your identity shifting? Because obviously you're a real yeah. Okay. So let's, you know what? I don't want to even fucking jump ahead. Okay. You grew up on the Upper West Side. Yep. Where'd you go to elementary school? PS 75. PS 75. 95th and 90, between 95th and 96th on West End. On West End. Right where the West Side Highway. I know. Yeah. My, one Funnels of my, on. One of my very best friends went to elementary school there. But oh, we're, really? We're so much older than you. You're not going to know who that is. How old are you? 50. You're not that much older. How old are you? At 36. That's much older. Yeah. Much um, older. Um. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, like, you're fucking... Upper West Side. Upper West Side. You know, get into Stuyvesant. Yep. When do you break into <laughs> and alcohol? Yeah, I was thinking about that last night because I was listening to one of your your previous guests. What'd you listen to? It was um that Chick Allegra. No, uh, Slocum maybe. Yeah, Rachel Slocum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was listening. I started listening and then. Didn't finish, not because I didn't want to finish. Of it's on not. my saved, <laughs> of <course laughs> pinned, yeah. pinned. Yes. Um, I think, I mean, like alcohol was always a, you know, my parents are artists. Like they gave us little glasses of wine when we were kids, um, you know, part of the part of the dinner party. So it wasn't like alcohol was never this like forbidden fruit. But I think the first time I drank like, to get like to to feel the effect or knowing that I would pick up the effect I was probably like 14 or or 15. What kind of artists were your parents? They're theatrical designers. So was it like like hippie free and easy at your house everyone's wasted all the time? I mean, no, they, you know. <laughs> they, you know, like like a theater dinner parties, right? right? Like, you know, stage directors and actors and, you know, so people aren't like strung out on, on no, the floor. No, no, not as far stuff. as I remember. No, okay. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. I don't think so. So you, you think the first time and were you, who were you with when you drank the wine? I was with a friend of mine who had, I had gone to elementary and middle school with her and she had moved to Connecticut and she was visiting and we were inviting this, this boy over and I, I don't remember if it was her idea or my idea, but we were like, okay, let's raid my parents' liquor cabinet. And we took, um, I don't know, like gin and vodka and something else and like put it in, not even the blender, but like in the food processor <laughs> with like ice cubes and orange juice and made like, we were like, oh, we're going to make a slushy. And it was like the most, you know, vile, disgusting, wasn't like not good. enough sugar, wasn't no. good. Um, drank it, had the boy over and... I think he knew we were like, we thought it was so cute and so funny and he probably thought it was cute and funny. And, uh, I'm sure he did. Yeah. Right. Like two, two cute little girls and, uh, um, and you're invi invited over. They're exactly, drinking alcohol. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And I think my, I don't think my parents were around, but I think my brother was around. And so we were like hiding it from him. Um, and you got away with it and we got away with it. Yeah. And then after that, I remember like one of my second times drinking, it was in the West Village um, Halloween parade. And I was with like all of my guy friends from high school. And we somehow we went to a, a Halloween party in like Bayside where like the guy was like, you can't bring alcohol into my parents' house. And everybody was like, that sucks. And I just remember being like, yeah, that sucks. Like only having drank once or twice and just you know, wanting to be part of that crowd. And then we left that party and went to uh, the West Village where a friend of mine lived and somehow got a hold of beers and were drinking on the like street corner. And I just remember thinking it was like so wild. I was like, there's cops everywhere and right. like, we're getting away with this. Right. Well, it's, it's and it, like they didn't care about, you know, well, some 20 years ago, right? 
you're, yeah, twenty years over twenty years ago, so probably twenty one years ago. You know, that was a time that wasn't such a notable time where young teens were drinking on the street. No, so I no. think like paper you're, bagging yeah, on the street. I yeah. think you did kind of like pull yeah. something off. I think you should have been proud. I uh, think yeah, I was really proud. Yeah, and I just remember, which I think about all the time now. Um, you know, I drank. I had like such a good time. I probably drank like a beer or a beer and a half. Um, but it was like noticeably more than anybody else drank, like however much I drank or however I reacted to it. And a guy the next day when we were taking the train home, this kid I went to high school with who I knew had a crush on me and I had like no interest in was like, you know, when you drink, you drink differently than everybody else. He said that to he you. He literally said that to me. He like gave you the and AA like pamphlet. Gave, yes. Like it was like, he was <laughs> like, like, you know, like here's in the 30 questions or whatever. And, and me being like, he just likes me. He just has a crush on me. He just is like pissed off that like when I drink, I can flirt with other guys who I actually right. like. And you were like, he's a fucking idiot. Right. Right. And he was probably like Bill Wilson's great grandson or something. Right. Totally. <laughs> and I'm just like, who is this like teetotaler rude who's like telling me like you know like I'm so cute I'm so funny I'm so great when I drink like who are you to and I think he like even put his arm around me like it was like very grandfatherly right I was just like who the fuck do you think you are that's interesting because I think when I was a kid I was like that guy really because I was too scared to to drink yeah I was too I was like uncomfortable to drink I thought when people like I remember when I was in junior high school or high school and girls would smoke cigarettes I'd be like you know, you're you're really not being yourself. Right, like right. I you're was trying, like, you're really not yeah, being. Yourself. Yeah, I was like this nerd, <laughs> right. per- like terrified of everything until yeah. I wound up becoming. A right, addict. right, and like, I mean, that's how it goes. It is. It's funny how because that that's goes. kind of how it went for me too. Like I remember my like a, a family member of mine who was older than me smoking a cigarette. And me being like thinking, well, I was probably like nine or 10 and she's probably like 13 or 14. And me being like, oh, the commercials say like you should tell a grown up if someone around you is like right. smoking cigarettes. And me being like, wait, should I tell someone? Should I tell a grown up that she's smoking a cigarette? It's like a tipping point thing. It's like, when do you get to the point where like for me, it was like I would drink and I got sick. I couldn't drink. Like yeah. I'd get too sick. Really? And then I like smoked weed and I was like, I like this. And then I was like alone at college and I was like, this is my total identity. I'm done with everything else. It's right, just right, this from that right, moment. right. But like, <laughs> and like I, such a quick transition. It was like, I had not like in my, yeah, in my first 18 years, I had enough identity via my friends and like my little nerdy life that I didn't need to totally become, uh, possessed by the stoner universe yeah whereas after 18 i was alone at some frat school in upstate new york and i was like i don't know what else to do right yeah so so when did you find like you yourself drinking on a daily basis or weed or like what was it that that where you found your identity shifting because obviously you're a real addict Well, you know, what's interesting is that when you say all that, like, I'm like, I don't remember having an identity before I started drinking. Like, it's so interesting to hear you say that because I'm just like, I think about for some reason, like as I like 35 is the first year where I'm like, holy shit, like, I really feel like, like, I don't know, like I'm aging and not in a bad way, but I'm just like, it's the first year where I've, you know, felt like, like this profound difference. And Like I've been thinking so much in the past year about how like I don't remember like being like an actual human. Like I don't think I had any opinions or any likes or dislikes or any like discernible like, I don't know, identifying factors about Janie before I got sober. Were you ever Jane or was it always Jane? I was Jane until I was in eighth grade, I think. Why did it become Jane? I was, okay, so I was... And I, I'm one of those people who's like, I'm born an alcoholic. I'm born an addict. Like my behavior from like the time I was like crawling is like so, you know, like addict behavior. But I was like really buzzy and fun and like the bossy, like little popular girl until second grade. And then something happened in second grade. And from second grade to like seventh grade, I was like the chunky, shy, like miserable loser. Do you have kid. any idea of what happened? I have no idea. It's like, so I have funny no to, idea. to put these, you know, like you're talking about, I have, I have a six year old daughter and I have a 14 year old daughter. Okay. So like I can observe like, this yeah, very, very yeah, well yes. in sobriety. Yeah. Right. And my six year old daughter 
like whatever. She's fucking going into first grade. <laughs> You know what I mean? Worst. It's like, yeah. it's not even the worst. It's like, she all she's like only really, she's getting the hang of right. talking. Right, she's like still a baby. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you're talking about by the time you were out of first grade, your yeah. life was over in your recollection. Yeah, I, I think that like, that's when like the, that like alcoholic addictive nature hit me. And I was like, you know, overwhelmed with like anxiety and fear. Like by the time I was in second grade. That's crazy. I was literally, and I remember some of like my most like formative earliest memories are just like being paralyzed by anxiety and fear. And just, you know, like I have this story about like I borrowed scissors from Ruben in third grade mm. and they were red scissors. And at the end of arts and crafts, he asked for his scissors back and I didn't know where they were. And my grandma was staying with us and the whole weekend Woolworths was still around. Yeah. The whole weekend I made her like go to every Woolworths to find red scissors and like wouldn't tell her why. Like I was just like, I really need red scissors. Right. And I'm thinking if I get these red scissors, he'll back, never know. He'll never know. You know, we could not find red scissors. She's like, why can't you? sleep why are you not eating like why are you so obsessed with red scissors like I'm unable incapable of telling her why I need these red scissors Monday morning rolls around we're back in arts and crafts class Ruben has his fucking red scissors and it's like that was like the next literally 18 years of my life until I got sober was like that like pursuit of like red scissors but unable to tell someone why I needed the red scissors that's an incredible story it's that, crazy that, that, that's the least dopey story that I get the most out of because it's so it's it really is like that neurotic I think we share I have a sense like I don't know you at all but just talking to you for a minute we have a similar like weird Makeup. thing I don't usually say to people mm. that they remind me of me Okay, but you have a thing in you like this weird sparkly like do you know what I'm, I don't know like it's just a weird thing that I'm sensing but maybe I'll take it as a compliment yeah, you or, you or also, something. You also like seem very cousinly to me. Cousin, yeah, you know, I can see that. I, I get, yeah, I get cousin. some cousinly vibes. Okay, okay. Is, that, is that weird of me to no, say? No, no. I definitely it's don't want to make. We think of the bear where they call each other cousin. I mean, there are some cousins in the bear, but they call. It, have, have you been watching the bear? No. Okay. No, I watched the don't first. Don't watch season. it. It'll make your anxiety go. Why? It's just it, it's hard to watch. Is it as good? Do you believe in the bear? So, I heard season two was not that great. Season two was amazing. Really? Season two was like me, like reliving my past, like three years of entrepreneur life. Season three is not as good. All right. Let's just, we're jumping. Okay. We're, we're, forget, I'm fuck ruining, the bear. I'm ruining, fuck the I'm bear. Ruining this whole <laughs> let's show. talk about scissors. <laughs> okay. So Ruben's Red Scissors, you're obsessed, neurotic. Yeah. Sure, you've destroyed everything. Right. By stealing. I ruined Ruben's life. Like, ruined Ruben's life. And you were very young. Yeah. I remember having feel like low self esteem yeah. in those years. Yeah. But I also went to like nerdy public school in Manhattan. Yeah. Well, I mean, me too. But exactly. I yeah. mean, I think that yeah. that plays a part. Yeah. And um, it's interesting. Very interesting. So like you, I, but my, I was like the nerd among the nerds. Like I wasn't like. No, I was definitely the cool, the cool one. See, among, I wasn't. Among, yeah, I, I was like the cool disaster. Okay. Like total mess. Shoes totally untied. Like wrong feet. I wouldn't go that far. Okay. But I, I, I like did not have it together. <laughs> I could see that for you. <laughs> I didn't have it together, but I sort of, but I was well liked. Yeah. But not, you know particularly appreciated by anybody okay Besides, well liked but not particularly i was well liked and i had my little crew yeah and i was like and i've diagnosed myself as like i was not without uh, a personality or without opinions yeah i was totally codependent on my crew mm. and it shifted from crew codependency to yeah, dependency that makes sense. yeah you just went right to alcoholic party girl 15. Yeah. Yes. It became my identity. It was like that, you know, it like saved me. Right. Like it like gave me, and I'm sure I had opinions and feelings, but like, I don't remember, like, I really don't remember anything except like just overwhelming, like self-hatred, self-doubt, low self-esteem. And I never had trouble except for maybe like a couple of years in between second and seventh grade. Like I never had trouble making friends. Like I, even in those years, I still had like core friends, but I just like don't remember like any, like, I don't know, like character in there. But you asked about Jane to Janie in eighth grade. I went and like seventh grade was not a great year. And eighth grade, but I was never like bullied, bullied, like just like, you know, like a little bullied. And eighth grade, my uh, 
I went to live in Kenya for half a year with my aunt and uncle who were like working in Kenya. And I was like, okay, this is coffee amazing. Coffee plantation? No, no, but I went to school on a coffee plantation. They were working like for the government. So like nice house, gated, gated fence, you know, like cook. Um, and I remember being like, this is my opportunity to like change who I am. Right, Like right. it really was. And, and it was such a spur of the moment thing. My brother was supposed to go. How old were you? I was uh, like 12 or 13. Right. So new, I was new like. New girl. Yeah. New yeah, name. New name. And it was just such a like, because I think about myself as a kid and I'm like, I was so full of anxiety. I was so codependent. I was so whatever, whatever. But then I was doing these like wild things, like being like, yes, yeah, send me to Kenya, like without my family for, you know, six months, which is so like, I can't relate those two like Janies to but, each other. But I can relate it to like addict yeah right like, like, like get um, me let me get out of here let me get and i'm willing to do anything to be in a totally different place right like be a super on the lower east side that becomes a addict who's homeless right. or, it was actually opposite i became a super when i got sober but we'll get into well that, that makes a lot of sense yeah because then you get a place to live exactly i just want to hear how did you did you know how to fix plumbing and stuff I don't know about plumbing, but the ring on my I'm washing like, I'm really machine good. isn't working. I'm really good. They don't have nobody has washing machines in the, in the, in the, the, in the building, not downstairs. No, Nowhere? they're all walk ups. So they're all going to the laundromat. Yeah, they're all going to the laundromat. They're all paying like five thousand dollars for like a shitty one bedroom and going to the laundromat. I dated this girl who was in one of those squat, you know, those squats. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah, yeah. And I feel like I she, don't know if those do those. Those don't really exist anymore. They do, really? but they turned into like you own. Oh, now them. they own them because it was like squatters, right? They, this is like yeah, what rent is about, right? Exactly, exactly. But she had a washing machine. Okay, that's does, that's pretty rare. And she had a super, and I think her super was named Pastrami. And Pastrami lived, <laughs> and lived across the hall. Pastrami the super. I think so. I think he had dreads. He was one of these white dready guys. But his name was actually Pastrami. And I think she called him Paz. Yeah, I think that's the story. Pause is short for pastrami. I, if, if memory <laughs> serves me at all. So you're, 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 were you like party girl in New York? Were you like going to clubs? Were you going to shows? Or were you just drinking? No, like by the time, you know, I, I even like in high school, like I was, I was a good girl. I was always a rule follower. I never had a fake ID. I didn't pick up at all, like not even weed until I was probably like 21. Mm. Uh, didn't try anything like until I was probably 21, 22. I don't know. Um, and my, and I first tried to get sober when I was 23 and didn't get sober till 25. So it was like a really quick, like, like the, you know, it, it was, it was quick and it was, um, and like alcohol was like always my primary substance. Like I just wanted to like not be present. Like I just wanted to pass out. I just wanted to like not be, I just didn't want to be here, but like I, I wasn't, I remember my dad saying to me, it's like every time you pick up a drink, you're trying to commit suicide and me being like, I'm not suicidal. When did he say that? Like probably half a year before I got sober. So probably when I was like 24 and like out on the streets and, and just not, you know, but, but like it was, I never, like I was never a, except for maybe like, I don't know, a couple times in high school, like I, I never drank or used with the intent of like having fun. Well, maybe I, maybe that was my intent, but like deep down inside, it was like I'm I'm going to drink till I'm oblivious. Oblivious, yeah. Right. And one thing that I I'm always interested in, and I never talk about too much anymore, being 50 and living on Long Island. But growing up in Manhattan, yeah. Like I grew up in Manhattan. I went to Hunter Elementary School and I went to Hunter High School. Yeah. And there's strata of all these private school kids that yeah. are going out all the time. Yeah. You went to PS 75 and you went to Stuyvesant, yeah. which is kind of along my track. Yeah. Where were you? Like, I didn't go out really at all. Yeah. I would, I went, by the time I was a teenager, like a late teenager, I went to like see bands and stuff. Yeah. But like, what were you doing like around teen years in New York city? I, I mean like a lot of like hookah bars, really? CBGB was still around. Like, um, God, like drinking at people's houses, yes. drinking on the street. There was this, my junior, senior, and maybe sophomore year, there was this bar called the Abbey Pub on 105th Street. And it was it was like right near my house. And it was like the meeting of every single like 
high school student. And right. I, it felt like it was like there were kids from like the Bronx. There were kids from like every private and public school knew that this place did not card. And like, I think I probably started drinking there when I was like 15 and it just so happened to be literally a block and a half from my house. Um, but, but yeah, it was like a lot of, I remember so many hookah bars, like, I, I don't know. Um, but it was, so I was going out, but it wasn't like I wasn't clubbing. I wasn't, um, like I, I'm not a clubber. I was never a clubber. When do you think you found yourself like, I have, I have a problem with alcohol. Did anybody tell you? Uh, no, not until I was probably, a, uh, after college, I went, or maybe, maybe my, ju- my senior year in college. Where'd like, you go to school? I went to university of Michigan. So it's like really Ann easy. Ann Arbor. Yeah. So it's easy. Like, you know, kids are drinking at like, you know, football's huge, right? Like I grew up in Manhattan. Like, what do I know about like big 10 schools? Um, and kids are literally tailgating at like 6am and I'm like, well, that's a problem, right? Like they're tr- waking up at 4am to like drink and drink all day. Like that's a problem. That's not me. And you weren't doing that. And I wasn't like, I was still drunk from the night before. Like who's, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an early riser. Like I'm not that dedicated to like my point of drinking is oblivion. Right. So like, why am I going to wake up at 4 a.m. if I'm already asleep? Yes. Um, I don't know. <laughs> did you, when did you start baking? When did, uh, I always like, I grew up in a family where we like cook to connect. So like, you know, even like I was really close to my cousins growing up. Uh, I spent a lot of time with them and I don't remember ever once with like our extended family going out to dinner. It was always like somebody or multiple people that are going to cook and we're going to eat around like a communal family table. So it was always like it you was, cook, yeah. you knew how to bake, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Okay. So you're at Ann Arbor, at which Ann is Arbor. a notorious party, party school. school. Yeah. yeah. Hash yeah. bash and yep. all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But you weren't smoking weed or doing. I wasn't sh- smoking weed or doing. Sh- like I, I, I had this, I was afraid of. Cause I knew I would really like it. And so I didn't like, and I probably got into like pills a little bit then. Yeah. Like what? Um, like Ritalin and stuff? like Ritalin. And I do have ADHD, but like, that could be the, the similarity I, I detect in us. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, and it's like pretty bad. And I like, you know, finally got a prescription. Actually, first I started stealing from someone stealing, and I was like, oh, this really works for me. And if I take more, it like works in a different way. Um, and then, you know, I had like some back problems. And so like got prescribed like low grade, like painkillers um, and like would drink with that even though. But there was a point where I was like, oh, it says don't drink. Like so there was some line where like I wasn't going to mix those two until a certain point, probably my senior year. And then. Drinking with painkillers. Drinking with painkillers. Because you were like, for whatever reason, even at this point, you're very guarded. You're not going to go over the line. I'm not going to go over the line. I'm like such a rule follower. Like I said, like I didn't even have a fake ID in Ann Arbor. Like I, and I was young for my age. I started college at 17. So I didn't have a, I wasn't 21 till like well into my senior year. Why'd you go there? It was, um, honestly, it was like a safety school. Like I couldn't like get it together to apply for colleges in the correct way. And I applied for a BFA in theater performance there and like somehow got in like five kids from around the country got accepted to this program. And somehow I got in and I was like, oh, I guess I meant to be a theatrical director, even though like I didn't. You Were know, you acting in high school and stuff? Is that a I thing? I was directing. Okay. Yeah. I'm not an actress. I like hate, I hate, uh, I hate being the center of the tension. But you were like, I'm going to be a director. Yeah, because I got into the program. And because my parents were, you know, in theater, right. I was like, oh, why not? You That's know? so interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because I and never. And I'm a control freak. Right, like, right. I'm artistic. Right. It just, it just, and I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And I. And it was something you knew very well. Like yep. it was in your family and it yep. was like, I could do that. Yeah, why not? I, I never hear about anybody that wants to do that without having some kind of acting piece. Yeah, interesting. But I also don't know any directors, so for yeah, me to so say that is, know. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know anything about now, it. Now the one director that you <laughs> yeah, know. <laughs> now, that, now that it's come out, I really don't know yeah. anything about it. Um, all right, so you're fucking in Ann Arbor, you're yeah. drinking, you're stealing Ritalin, you're getting yeah. Ritalin prescribed, you have yeah. back problems, you're, you're fucking around with Percocets or Vicodins yeah. or something, Yeah. and what happens to you? So my senior year, uh, 
in between and, and junior year. So I had, I was in this, my freshman and sophomore year, I was in this like crazy relationship with a guy back in New York who went to a, you know, a fancy private school here. And he was, um, in college here and he was like super controlling and super like emotionally, verbally abusive. And I remember like he, I remember my sophomore or freshman year, like something happened where I like kind of cheated on him and he found I out. Mean, kind of cheated on it him. It was like, it, it was uh, unfortunate. I don't want to get too much into it, but it was like someone took advantage of me. Right. And so, and, and cool. now I even say that I'm like gaslighting myself. Right. I'm like someone took advantage of me when I was passed out and I'm even like, how is that cheating on him? Exactly. exactly. That's what's so fucked up. That's what's so fucked up is like 17 years later, I'm still gaslighting myself into being like, I kind of cheated. That's wild. I can't believe I said that. Because you didn't cheat on him. No, I didn't. You got like molested, passed out. Yes. It's a much different thing. Exactly. And it was wild because it so happened that this guy was on a baseball team in New York playing division one baseball. The, your boyfriend or the molester? My boyfriend. Okay. His, the guy who took advantage of me, his roommate was, I've never told this story. His roommate was um, best friends with someone on the baseball team with this kid in New York, which mm, is wild, yes. like across the country, Michigan. And somehow like the, the two things come up. And so this becomes like, and that's how he found out. That's how he, so wild. Isn't that so crazy? That's unfortunate. It's so <laughs> crazy. It's like four degrees of separation. And it's the most specific unconnected fucking shit ever. It's like two like room. It, it's crazy. But I'm hearing more and more like, stories like this like not like this one in particular but like i have this friend who and whatever this is a tangent i have this friend who's like men you know borderline total bipolar schizophrenic like total crazy person and he grew up on the upper west side okay and he had all these problems and up till a year ago was totally suicidal like was just Mm -hmm. sending me pages and pages of of Mm -hmm. of suicidal ideation or begging me to him like crazy stuff yeah. and i've been friends with him since junior year of high school or God, something yeah and i talked to him last night and he's like better good and he's better because he like got a girlfriend <laughs> and who like hey, hey, and hey, that's hey, yeah, yeah who like loves him and he and like right, he was like right. he was like neglected yeah. by his parents oh. and not loved and never had love and like total like scamp like you know kicked out of every mm-hmm. house he had ever been in and It turned out this girlfriend had an apartment in the building he grew up in, in the same apartments that floor up. Wow. And it's just for no reason. And then my other best friend like made it as this big corporate lawyer and his whole, and he married this Swiss girl and his whole success came from being the, the, the contract lawyer for the Swiss bank, totally disconnected from the wow. fact that his wife was Swiss. Wow. So, th- I mean, it sometimes it's interconnected. Sometimes I wonder if life is not just a total simulation, <laughs> like the Matrix bullshit. Like, how does that even happen that the guy who fucking takes advantage of you is connected to your boyfriend I in know. New York. It's horrible. It's yeah, but it's just these weird things. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if my stories actually make any sense. Have no, you, no, no, no. I got you. It's I this got weird, you. Yeah, like blueprint. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's it's on all top like of weirdly us. interconnected, and, and we don't know why or yeah. how or yeah. or really. Is there a why? Probably. I don't not. know. I'd say no. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> At least for that, uh, I don't know. Well, for everything. So what happens? Yeah. He finds out. So he finds out and. Basically, like, it's this whole, like, shit show. He found out at the end of my uh, freshman year. And so the summer I go home for my, you know, freshman to sophomore year. And he's just, like, out of control. Like, you have to call this guy. You have to tell him he's a piece of shit. You have to whatever. You have to, you're a piece of shit. So he heard the story from the dude. No, he didn't. Yeah, he heard the story. And I didn't say, like, I, I didn't say, like, that's not what happened. The story he heard was, oh, Janie hooked up with this guy. Yeah. And instead of me being like, no, here's what really happened. I'm just like, you know, I don't remember if I like denied it or was like, I was so drunk. Like, I just like, I wasn't like, I wasn't 
and this is probably like, you know, 20 years ago or however long, 18 years ago, it was different, but like, Consent you know, it was very different. Yes, exactly. And so like females, young females weren't programmed to be like, that's actually not what happened. Like I was just like, like, you know, like I was just like along for the ride now and just like, I'm, I am a piece of shit, you know, like you're right. I am a piece of mm. shit. And just like, you know, taking that all on and instead of being like, fuck you, like, and you know, leaving, like, I'm just like, what can I do? What can I do? How can I make this right? How can I make this right? And so it was it's like, Ruben's oh, red scissors all it's, over again. It's crazy. Like it's totally crazy. And like, and I'm, you know, and, and it's such like the classic abusive thing. It's back and forth between him being like, and, and what's crazy is then I ended up that whole summer cheating on him, like actually intentionally with someone and, and you the know. The same guy. No, no, <laughs> no. Um, but, but like it, it just like, so, so this whole summer, like he's telling me like, I'm a piece of shit and, and we stay together my sophomore year and he's like, when you go back to school, you can't drink. And so now it's like my whole sophomore year is controlled drinking. Like, okay, so I'm in this codependent, obsessive relationship with this guy. Like, how can I like drink just enough so that when we talk on the phone at 2 a.m. on a Saturday every five minutes, like he doesn't know I'm drunk. And so, uh, and then at some point he was like, okay, you can drink again. And so it was like this weird. And then I ended up my, uh, at the end of my sophomore year, He's like, hey, like, I think I want to see other people. And I'm like, great. Like, this is amazing. Like, great. Awesome. Like, and so I like proceed to have this amazing summer where he ends up. It was like the ideal summer for me because as soon as he says it and as soon as I say great, he's like regretting it. And right. he's not out having fun. He's chasing me while I'm out having fun, you know, and being like, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. And, and, and Wait, it's you're just sorry like, that you agreed to his plot? No, he's so sorry oh, now. Right. Now he's so sorry. I'm out doing whatever the fuck right. I want, having the best, like, you know, summer of my life, working as a hostess in New York, like 19, adorable, you know, going out, like just having such a good time. And he's being like, I'm sorry, I'm the piece of shit. So it's like this high, right? So all it's of a sudden like you, this, ha you have hand. I have the power. Yes. Yeah. And so we go back, I go back my junior year of college and he's like, I want to, like, I want, don't please, like, can we please stop seeing other people? Can we please be exclusive again? Can we please whatever? And I'm like, no. And he's like, you know, he sets some sort of boundary where he's like, fine, like we can't talk. And I'm like, that's fine. So I go back my junior year and it's like that I have arrived moment, right? Where I'm like, I'm finally You're like, free. I'm free. Like I'm at University of Michigan. Like I haven't been able to drink fully. I haven't had a lot of friends the past two years. Like I'm in this like off campus apartment, like I'm having a blast. And it's the first time where it was like this consistent. It was like, now I'm around people who it's like not just drinking Friday and Saturday. It's drinking like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Because you know? probably that dude had this incredible scaffolding over your whole life yeah. where you couldn't do what you wanted to do, which is unfortunate until all you really want to do is do drink alcohol. Drink. I know, yeah. <laughs> and so it's like for the first time, it's like I'm crossing a line and I'm just like, you know, out. Uh, yeah. And, and it didn't really catch up with me until like, there were a couple things where like, you know, my roommates would be mad at me and I wouldn't know why. And then it would, I would make it right. And I'm like a, I'm like so codependent. I'm such a people pleaser that like I'm always going to make it right. And um, and then my senior year. This well, it's good to make it right, though. No, it's good to make it right. But like not. I mean, I it's get like it. The, no, for your, your whole sanity. It's like I make it right it. and then I fuck it up right away again. Like I don't actually care about the making it right part at that time. I just care about you not being mad at me. Right. It's like that lady you had to fire. Yeah. Oh my God. It's very similar though, right? Oh my it's, God. Yeah. It's the same story. Yes. yes. And, it's, and then I say that and we can circle back to that yeah. at the end, but like I have the same needs. Like if things aren't where I want them to be, I'm like, what the fuck? Like I can't live with it. Yeah. You know, like, like this thing for DopeyCon, like this yeah. guy dropped me out. I'm like, how am I going to, He's like, he's not going to be able to tell me for a week. Right. And so how, how am I, I going to survive for how the rest am I gonna of the next live, week? How am I yeah. going to live with that? Yeah. And it's, and it's anything like that. Yeah. So, yeah. so back to, back to your freedom. So my senior year, we have this, and I, this is like the only moment that I can like ever pin back to. And I don't know why it is actually significant, but we have this, I'm living in this off campus house and someone turns the, the heat off to save electricity 
when we're all on winter break and like, you know, we're all city kids or whatever, like, or, or not even city kids. Like we all, you know, are, are children and we don't know anything about pipes freezing, you know? Yes. And so. And city kids. <laughs> right. And city kids. And so like the pipes freeze and then they unfreeze and then they burst and then our house is flooded. And so like I'm displaced for about a month or two and I'm feeling just so like, you know, I don't have a spot. Like all my stuff is ruined. Like I'm just feeling so like, like fucked up that like, I'm like, okay, how can I like self soothe? Like I have terrible untreated anxiety. I've had insomnia since I was like, you know, three, like, how can I like make this right? And so it's like, then it's like the first time I turned to alcohol is like an actual like solution towards, I don't even know how to say it, but like an actual like medicine. Like, yeah, like medicating the yes, problem. Exactly. And it, not just like medicating like how I feel, but like medicating like the situation. Like the situation. Yeah. And so and then it's like, you know, I'm I'm sleeping late and I'm not going to class and it's Where were you like, staying when you got I was on staying house. at a friend, one of my best friends had this huge he lived in a, you know, house full of guys and he had this huge like attic apartment. And so, and he was like my bestie all through college. And he was like, oh, you know, I have this little alcove you can stay in. So I'm staying with him and probably just like sucking the life out of, you know, his like situation just because like, you know, he's waking up going to like sports practice at like 5 a.m. And I'm like, you know, and he's coming back, going to class, coming back and I'm like still asleep, um, which I'm, I don't know. So I like, I'm moved. sure, I'm sure it was fine for him. I'm sure he, he enjoyed the process. <laughs> Maybe who, who, I'll see him in a couple yeah. months at my wedding, yeah, so I'll ask him about yes, it. Yes. Yeah, um, I'll call you at DopeyCon. Yeah, I'd like to know. Okay, um, so it's like sort of the first time, and I remember like staying at uh, his house, and and like now I'm not around my friends; I'm around his friends, and so if I like drink to blackout, like it's more embarrassing, right? And there was this one night where I like. Uh, like got blacked out, came home to his house and like just like sat on his roommate's bed, like totally. And I was like one of these people who when I blacked out, I was like catatonic. Like I was just like unresponsive. Wow. Right. Like, but like my eyes would be open. Like apparently it was like weird. Scary. Like it would be like I'm possessed. Right. right. And so his friends, you know, he comes and helps me to bed and it's like, and his friend I, I like thought was really cute too. And so it was like even more mortifying because I'm like, oh, this guy is like so attractive. Like I have a little crush on him. Like I'm just sitting there catatonic on his bed. And it was like the first time where I was like, okay, like I drink with the intent of having fun and feeling good. Right. But I don't remember anything that happened. So if, if I did have fun, like what's the point? Because I don't remember and, you know, I wake up and I don't know what I did and people are possibly mad at me or like distressed about something I did. And so like, what's the, what's the point? But like, I actively can't stop. Like I, I logically, I'm like, why am I doing this? Like I'm writing in a journal. Why am I doing this? But like actively, like I have no power to like stop that from continuing to play out. And you can remember very clearly, these are like those first sober, curious thoughts. Yeah. And it's also very much an echo of that kid when you're 16, who's like, you can't, you don't drink like everybody else. Right, and I'm sure right, like that, right. like yeah. flashes yes, back and it's yes. like, holy shit. And you don't want to be catatonic on, you know, handsome boys bed. You no. want to be bubbly and adorable. Right, you. right, right. Like I, it, I want a different situation right. than handsome boys bed. Right, right. And so then I learn at some point along the point, like I'd never drink alone. I'd never used alone and at some point I started smoking weed that year and I like I was one of those people who like never liked weed but would just like smoke it just to be like I'm not a I'm not a pothead like I every time I like smoke and I'm sober I'm like checking my pulse to see if I'm right, still right, alive right, right. but I'm still like it's preferable over being sober and so you know at some point like that year I'm like okay like you know, we have weed at our house, like it's communal, but like I can smoke it alone and like hide it. And then, you know, I can drink before we go to pregame because then I'm like a little bit ahead and I'm not no having to count. To Nobody right. needs to see. And then at some point I was like, oh, like if you drink a little bit when you're hungover, it feels a little bit better. And so like I'm high. And these are like the first like baby alcoholic Janie moments where I'm like starting to like sort of like hide it, but it's not totally out of control. Like I'm still you know, functional. Uh, I'm still functional. Um, and then at some point I must have had like, uh, what's it called? Like tr what the tremors, like the, uh, the what DTs, is that? delirium yeah. tremens. Yes, exactly. Delirium tremens. Because at some point my so senior year. It's weird that word tremens. Because you, th you think it's supposed to be tremors, 
But like it's tremens. It is tremens. Why yeah, is it tremens? I, I don't. I don't Maybe know. that's some Latin form of tremors. Maybe. But yeah. so you're. So what are the first so DTs? So I like something weird is happening in like my like my brain felt like it was shaking and I somehow related it to the drinking, which is wild because it was I wasn't even drinking like that much because I I went on to later at 23 and 24 like have really serious DTs, but like at like 21 I'm like. Somehow I'm like, can, can drinking cause like a brain bleed? Like can drinking, like I'm like looking up, like I can't quite like figure out what you want to jump. Is. You want to jump alcoholism to like some sort of like alcohol yes. poisoning yes. or like, but I like in my Googling and maybe Google was just like not that good. Like, yeah. you know, 18 years ago, right. but in my Google Pre-web DTs MD. never comes up. Right. Like, and so I'm like, be, possibly because I had no idea what it was, so I'm not Googling correctly. It's like Google is enabling your alcoholism. Right, it's right. not mentioning. It's, it's crazy. It's not mentioning yeah, the, the it's not piece. mentioning like DTs. Right. It's just like, I'm like, can alcohol cause a brain bleed? Brain bleed. Like, and so it's, but it's so interesting, like, like flashback a couple of years later, like that's what was happening was that I was like, you know, at my senior year of high school, uh, college, like once or twice having DTs, um, and then I, you did know, did you find yourself drinking when you did and it cured it or did you no, not? No, because know? I wasn't, I didn't know it. And I wasn't like, I wasn't that, my behavior wasn't that alcoholic at the time. It was like, I was learning little tips like, okay, like I can drink before we go out or I can drink in the bathroom, but I wasn't like that full blown, like, like I still had like boundaries for myself and right. like lines I wouldn't cross. Um, and then I go, you know, I graduate college and I have like no idea what the fuck I want to do. Like I can't, like, I think I want to be in theater. I think I want to be in film. I have no idea how to write a resume. Paralyzed by fear. Like unable, incapable of like applying for a job. Uh, move, end up moving back to Ann Arbor. And it's a total Wait, where did you? Where, I moved back home to New York, spent like three months in New York. I'm like, oh, Ann Arbor is where it's at. Like I like, you know, convinced myself that like, that, you know, Detroit had all these, this is so ridiculous. <laughs> Detroit was giving tax breaks to the film industry for like, they were trying to bring, it was like after the car industry collapsed right. in like Detroit and they're trying to bring we'll tax give, incentives. Like five grand to every young filmmaker. Who well, no, they're Detroit. doing, they're filming these big movies in Detroit. And I'm like, oh, this is where like the movie industry is. Like, let me move back to Ann Arbor where it's like, really, I just want to move back to like my alcoholism. And to, to not like here, it can be overwhelming. I'm an adult here. You're an adult, and you're no. And I mean, I had a similar thing where I was like, I can't do it here because I'm gonna disappear. Right. Like it's too big, right. and I'm yes. not gonna be able to accomplish anything. Yes. And and I never felt like that until I was a addict. I always felt like I never felt like I could do whatever I want. Like I never felt like I could run New York, but I never felt intimidated you, by I, it. Either. Yeah. Same. Yeah. That's a good. Description. Description. Though. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Because we understand it. But yeah. when I was in, in addiction, I was like, I can't live here. Yeah. It's too much. Yeah. And I think you get to go be a big fish in Ann Arbor who gets to drink like a fish. Right. And then I'm not even a big fish in Ann Arbor. Right. right. And I like it was like a total shit show. Like I couldn't even get a job. I somehow ended up like renting two apartments, but not paying rent at either, which is like a whole nother. Why I, did like, you rent two apartments? I like it, it's like so crazy. It's like such alcoholic behavior like, and, and rent was like $200 a month, you know? So it's like, I couldn't even like figure out how to pay $200 a month. So I owed all this back rent. I'm taking my roommates checks and cashing it and not even so, so I'm having two people not pay rent. And then like after living three, on their rent, living on their rent after like three or four months of this, like the landlord's like, you need to pay rent. So I'm like, okay, let me go find another apartment. But I, instead of like leaving that old apartment now, I have like two apartments. <laughs> That's like and a so dream. That's like a crazy. drug dream or something. It's so crazy. And my like dad ends up coming saving me and be like, can you like, how did you end up in two apartments? And like, luckily like the rent is like two or $300 a month, but. So it's like a thousand dollar problem instead of like a $5,000 like, or problem. whatever it would yeah. be here, like right. a $20,000 yeah. problem. But I, so I meet this guy and like my alcoholism is like really out of control. At this point, I'm not even like as bad as it got for me, but I think it really was like for me like the, I don't know how to say it, but like the emotional bottom because I'm still like a person, right? I'm not just like my whole identity is not just alcoholic, which like happens like a year or two later. Like I'm still like an actual person. Like I'm still like a young lady who just graduated from like a really good school, 
you know, I'm still like smart. I'm still smart. I'm still like put together. I'm still like around like stylish. Yeah. And I still have like friends. I still have like my family still, you know, I'm still part of my family. And, um, so it was like kind of devastating because I'm, um, like it was like the first time that there were like consequences for my drinking where it was like, okay, like the social circle that I have left in Ann Arbor, which was like not my best friend who's still my best friend now was living in Ann Arbor. And that was part of the reason I moved back was I was like, okay, I can like be around him and that'll provide me like this. Um, I don't know, like emotional support I need and codependency. Yeah. And, and I'm, and, and the thing is the, the time in which when I was in New York for like the three or four months, um, I was on the phone with him every night for like hours. And so I'm like, okay, I'll move back to Ann Arbor. Like that'll be good. And that was like that, that was the bright spot of this six months that I spent in Ann Arbor was him. But it it wasn't a romantic relationship. It wasn't a romantic relationship at all, like at all. And it's, um, like that was like the bright spot and the saving grace of, of, like that, that time there, uh, but he's like working a, a nine to five job and, um, and I'm trying to like, be like, okay, like I'm, you know, dating people. I'm, you know, trying to like, and my social circle for the most part has gone because like we graduated. And so it's like the social circle I do have there is like in grad school and doing like big things and just like has no time for this bullshit anymore or they're like a year younger than me and I just like feel like inferior and like, what I'm am the, I doing? What am I doing? Like, I'm not like person who's like arrested development, you know? And so it was just like this, like really, really dark time where I, it was like the first time where I was like, Oh, and I don't, I actually don't like really suffer from depression. Like I've never, like I suffer from like crippling anxiety and I suffer from insomnia and I have a whole like myriad of like mental like ADD, like mental health stuff, but like depression's like not a thing that that's been very present in my life. And during this period of time, I was like really depressed. And right. like, even if I'm not drinking, I'm still sleeping like around the clock. Um, well, you and, know what everybody says about that? It's that alcohol is a depressant. It really is. I mean, it, it truly is. Right. It's wild. Um, And I, and sort of like everybody in my life is like, you can't like, you can't behave like this. Like, it's like, it's not working. It's not working. Like, and it's embarrassing and it's like causing like, you know, havoc in other people's lives. And I meet this guy, um, who I like start like dating and he's sober and I'm like, there's something, and I'm like, kind of disgusted that he's sober, but I'm also like, I've never met a guy with like, he just, he was my age. Like he wasn't like, he, but he just seemed so much older and he just had this light about him. And I was like, but he was like playful and, and like, he just like, he was like emanating this light. And he was right? an alcoholic though. N- no, I think he was, I mean, he was, he was sober just, from other substances. Okay. Yes. He wasn't, he was sober. Like he wasn't, I don't think alcohol was his primary substance, right. he, but, but he, he was, was in recovery. He was in recovery. And he is just like emanating this light. And I'm like, but what do you do? Like, what did you do for your 21st birthday? And he's like, oh, we got like a keg of root beer. And then we broke into the public pool. And I'm like, you know, like, like he's like proving that like you can have a good time when you're sober. But like, and you know, he's like, my friends still drink. It's fine. Like I have friends who are sober. It's fine. Like they get along. It's fine. And I'm just like, how, like how does that work? And and like, but like falling for him. Right. And just being like, I've never met a guy like this. And of course, like he, you know, of course this is very short lived because like I'm drinking every night till I black out and and he's sober. Yeah. And he's like, and so he ends up like, I'm, I'm living like the reason I met him is because I'm living with a, a group of his, his friends who are all female And basically they end up like being like, you have to leave this house because you can't stay sober, like, and you need to be sober. And he's, you know, writes me, he ends up writing me this email that I still remember. I wish I had this email somewhere. And of course I deleted it and like never was able to see it again. But it like the tie, the subject line was like a piece of unsolicited advice. Mm. And then he goes into this like long, really heartfelt, like beautiful email about like what light I have and like how you know, alcohol seems to really be affecting my life and like his solution, right? The solution that he's found and that like, if I want a solution, like he can help me find that solution. And I'm just kind of like so mortified. Like I'm not even like, how dare he? I'm just like so mortified 
that I'm like, I can never see this person again. You know, like I like it's not even an option. Because, to like, do you think it's because he thought you were an alcoholic and you were like, <gasps> I'm yes. an alcoholic. Like, I, I don't even know. It's just fear. I think it was just fear and me like being like, oh, this is something good that I lost. Right. And I have no way of getting it back. It's gone. Right. Like, I mean, who knows what could have happened. But like it's in my mind. It's funny how just, that goes. It's like because at some point I, 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 I need to salvage everything now. But there were points in my life where something like that would happen and I'd be like, it's over. It's over. And like, it's gone forever. Yeah, too bad. And I would yeah. never try to salvage it. And, no. And, and it's it, not even an option. It's just interesting how that even happens. So, yeah. So you have it's like this, you're crippled. Right. This glimpse of, of light, sanity, love, acceptance, future, hope, and you're like, gone. I'm like, it's too bad. And he's literally like, you know, holding out his hand. He's like, I can help you. Like, here's who to call. Here's what to do. Here's where to go. And I'm just like, but it's a seed. Yeah, it's a seed. And, um, I end up moving back to New York and like, that's where like the alcoholism like really begins. Did you me. bottom out in Ann Arbor again before you did? So I, I like bottomed out. Well, yes, because like basically like the, the people who were left in my life had called my parents and were like, you have to come collect your child, like your 22 year old child. What were some of the things that made it the end of it? Just like I couldn't write, I couldn't pay rent. I'm like living in two apartments. I don't have a job. I'm drinking around the clock. I'm stealing from, you know, my roommate. I'm, uh, you know, like these lovely people I was living with after I got, I got kicked out of a house. Like I'm in another house, you know, I'm like, I'm just, I'm like a mess. What are your folks say? They, it's like basically like I like it's like the only sort of intervention there ever was where they basically like show up in Ann Arbor surprise with the car and they're like we're taking you back to New York surprise yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so and they were like very lovely and kind about it and they're like you need help and and so they bring me back to New York and it's like the first talk is like okay like do you need to go to rehab and like I'm like looking and they're like, okay, do some research on rehab. And I'm looking up like rehabs with yoga. Like re like I don't do yoga, but I'm like, I can only go to a rehab where there's yoga. It's like you Kenya, know? Kenya all over again. You right. Can, you can be right. a different person. Yes, exactly. And I'm like, but somehow like the like I I uh am not um like I'm able to maintain this six or seven or eight month dry period where I'm like, okay, like I'm I'm not drinking, like I don't need rehab. Like AA doesn't even Cross my mind, um, like just like there's no, like there like rehab doesn't cross my mind. Detox, I don't even know that detox exists. Like, like I'm just like okay, I'm like abstaining from alcohol, and you know, I'm not no recovery though. Yeah, like nothing, and um, and it's like the most miserable period of my life, like the most miserable Here. period. Yes, and like now I have no friends because. And at some point, um, I don't remember if it was before that or, or during that or after that. Um, actually, so yeah, so it's like I'm dry, and uh, and I one of the reasons that I can like pin to that I am able to be dry is that I've lost my ID, and so I can't go get alcohol, right? And so somehow, like after you know six or seven months, I get a new ID, and it's like all of a sudden. Like I'm no longer dry, and it was a great some restriction. Point, it was a great restriction. People should suggest that to people. It's wild. To young yeah, people, exactly. And um, I somehow like end up like seeing an addiction psychiatrist, and like he prescribes me like, which is wild. Like like our I, this is a whole nother conversation, a whole nother podcast, but like the things that like you can get prescribed as like an active alcoholic. Whoa, did he, what like, did he's he prescribing offer? me benzos and, and, um, so now I'm like drinking and taking pills. And what I remember, is he giving you? I don't even remember. So it was some benzo like, uh, like Xanax or Clonopin. Yeah. Or Ativan. Ativan, and I how think. are your folks dealing with you? Well, so the thing is, is that because I'm living with them and the rule is that I can't drink is that I'm going through these periods of time where it's like I'm abstaining for two or three weeks and then like just having this like four or five day blackout. And it's like the same thing every time. Like you can't drink, like you can't drink. You're not going to be welcome here if you drink. And at some point I, um, I take a sleeping pill or whatever I'm on and like end up blacking out on the phone with my best friend. And he's like, you know, the next morning he texts me and is like, 
I need to talk to you. Mm. And I'm like, okay, I can never talk to him again. Like he could have been what, like, you knew it was coming. It could have right. been like, I need to talk to you about my visit to New York. It right. probably was. I need to talk to you about <laughs> the fact that you passed out last night on the phone, but it like, it could have been anything. And this is the pattern. Somebody spots like you're fucked and you're like, okay, I'm done with you. Right. Right. <laughs> what I'm do done I do with now? you or you're done with me. Right. Like it's even more like self deprecating. It's not like, you it's just like i guess like they don't want to be my friend anymore no i think it's more like i can i can it's the disease or whatever yeah. saying stay with me don't right, listen right, to right, them right, my precious yes. forget about that guy. there might be hope there yeah or this that guy is gonna ruin everything we've built up right, everything to get you, this relationship yes, that we have exactly so i end up like having nobody in my life, right? The only people in my life are my parents. My parents are like, if you don't stay sober, you can't live here. I go to uh, a detox. Here? Here. Um, But I didn't even need it. Like I thought it was like rehab. Like I'm two or three days sober. I go to detox for two or three days. Like I think it's like rehab. Um, You're hoping it's like glamping or something. Right. right. I mean, it's like public. It was like St. Luke's Roosevelt on 114th Street when it still existed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I. It's not glamping there. No, it's not (laughs) glamping there. And they like lay out this, like, you know, the next steps. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to take those steps and sort of like repeat that pattern over and over again. And then I end up basically like it's the last draw with my parents. It's like you can't live here. If Unless, you do this, right. If you do this. And so I end up going to like a IOP program and the IOP programs right near here. It was Hazelden and now it's like Hazelden, Betty, then Betty Ford by Hazelden. Where is it? Like a 20, 26 and eighth. No way. How do yeah. I not know about that? I don't know. That's crazy. It's like Hazel. Do you know Hazelden? You yeah, know Hazelden. Sure, of course. So there are IOP programs like right here. That's insane. Yeah. Because I was a like right here and I didn't know and you about had no it. idea no. I mean I didn't even know his didn't exist yeah I'm there. I, I, that could have been very useful to me yeah that's interesting yeah um so I wonder I, if it's still there I think it is I'm gonna seek it out yeah seek it out anyway it's keep, like on the 14th floor or something on it's 26 like right, and I think 8th? it's 26 or yeah between like it's right on the corner all right did you, I, I don't look wanna, it up I, Google I, maps I'll, it I'll, I'll yeah. google, I'll google, google it. maps it <laughs> thank you um so, so I do end IOP. up there. I do, and I I'm under the impression there's no such thing as a female alcoholic who's under. Why? I've just it's like You've you could be a heroin that. addict, you could be a cocaine addict. That's romantic, but like just like a straight up female alcoholic who's like under the age of fifty, like doesn't exist, or alcoholics under the age of fifty, period, don't exist. Right. Um. You people cope with their drinking. Right. People or they cope can with just drink. Drinking. Right. right. They don't just stop. Like it's so embarrassing. Like it would be fine if I had like a heroin problem or a cocaine right. problem, especially or a of that program. time. Yes. But I'm like, I'm like, I'm 23 or 24, and like this is like so mortifying. But I get there and I'm grouped with a, a bunch of young um, people, and it just like blows my mind. I'm like, oh my god, these people are speaking my same language. Like these people have the exact same problems as me. I'm relating. I'm like. All my friendships before are fake. Like I'm like relating. These on are my level. people. Yeah. Like yeah. it was well, this were. wild thing where I'm just like, how did like, I don't understand what's going on. And I end up staying sober for about four months. Like I found a 12 step program, a recovery community. I ended up staying for four months, staying sober. Were you still at your folks? I was still at my folks. And like, everything's going great. Best four months of my life. And I'm just like, God, this is like, I'm never going to drink again. And then I start uh, stealing prescri- prescription but where does it come from? It comes from I'm I'm babysitting and it comes from a, you know a family that I'm babysitting and I'm stealing prescription. What from. were you taking? I was taking it was a uh, Vivant, so like Adderall, Ritalin, and I'm like, oh, I've been prescribed this before, like it's fine, you know. So I'm I'm stealing now, and that's the high, In right? Sobriety. Like I love stealing. Yeah, yeah, who doesn't? Yeah, love it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm I sober. wish I could steal and be sober. I know. But anyway, I know. Keep, keep going. So I I'm stealing. I'm like feeling good. And, and I'm still like, I'm never going to drink again. And I'm still like justifying it. I'm like, but these were prescribed to me at one time. Like I could go out and get a prescription. I just like, I'm not doing that. I'm just doing this instead. And, um, I end up, I don't remember. And I think like you're in the fellowship you're in, 
there's kind of an illusion to not doing that, but right. it's very much in the fine print. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> it's, exactly. not, it's not exactly. on the top exactly. lines exactly. of anything. It's like live a, a good, uh, you know, healthy, right. uh, honest right. life. But it's, it's in the fine print. Right. But it's like, And it's like if you need to be prescribed medication, you should be, and I'm sure you were like, oh, this is close to that. Totally. This is similar to that. Totally, yeah, yeah. yeah. totally. Ex- right. It's totally similar. Like I never got prescribed... Um, any stimulants yeah. and I desperately needed them in so every, in every way, yeah. in every, it's up yeah. to this day. Yeah. And like, I don't do it yeah. because I'm a yeah. addict and like, I'm fearful of like what it will do to me. But just even hearing about like Vyvanse, like I've never yeah. taken a Vyvanse, yeah. but I've read a bit about it yeah. and I feel like it could really help me. It's so interesting because I'm not prescribed, like I'm not on any mood alter. Like even though like, like I have terrible insomnia, like I did not sleep last night. Like it would have been so nice to pop an Ambien or like I have terrible ADD. You like won't take melatonin. I will. Yeah. But that doesn't work. It works for me. Really? Yeah. It doesn't like I, I have non-addictive and I'm like, I'm very much on the, um, like I'm not against prescription at all, No. but I know for me that like it would be dangerous for me at this point in my life to take uh, a stimulant ADD medication. Maybe some point in my life it's, it's ever crippling, like maybe that will be an option, but for me today it's not an option. I would say we're, we're, we are both too functional to risk exactly. our functionality. And that's exactly how I feel. And I'm like, okay, so I didn't sleep last night. Like I'm still here, you know? One of the, the worst cliches is, no one's ever died from not sleeping enough. I literally enough. had this conversation with someone the other day. The worst. It's awful. Yeah, they told me that in rehab. Yeah. Of I was like, tell, I haven't slept yeah. in two weeks. And they were like, a scientific studies show that you only need two hours of sleep a night. There should I was be like, like, fuck you. should be think, 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 easy does it, live and let live. And no Nobody one's ever, ever died, died from in not sleeping. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So so what do you do? So you're, you're stealing Vyvanse, making yeah. meetings, and what, what happens? So I, um, my parents go out of town. And I'm like, oh, and I'm dating this guy who's sober and I'm like so in love. And I'm like, I've never had a relationship where I've like, you know, been able to communicate with someone like this. And I'm like, oh, his friend's in town visiting. Like I'm meeting his one of his friends from home for the first time. Like, let me have a beer before I meet them. And I'm going to feel how good. Does, how does it's that even wild. Right. It's wild. Right. It's right. just an idea. Right. And then that idea is in my head. And I'm like, I can't unthink that idea. Like it's because like the, consequ- right? the consequences hadn't built up and the sobriety hadn't built it up. Had it, yeah, exactly. And I'm just like, and I'm, I'm like half-assing sobriety. I'm like, okay, so these are the rules that are laid out. I'm a rule follower. I'm going to follow them, but I'm not going to be. And the other thing too is that like, and I left all this out in the past hour and a half we've been talking, but like I'm under the impression that like stoicism is sexy. Like I'm like, you know, from this family where like, you know, like, like, it's just like the idea of like sharing how I feel about anything or like having any opinion other than like neutrality is like the idea that the words, like even at a young age of like that hurt my feelings is like, there's nothing less sexy or less like you can have feelings. You can like, you know, be sad about something, but like nothing. And this was like a hard held feeling that I've like had since a young age was that. And like, I talked to my mom now and it's like devastating to her that she didn't know that like, how, that's stoic, how, you were. how stoic I was. Like, I was just like, like, I didn't like, like, I remember one of my earliest memories is like, um, and I think this is why I'm like, okay, this is why I feel like I was born an alcoholic or an addict because this like feeling is so uh, relatable to so many people who are, alcoholics and addicts but like I remember my godfather died when I was seven around the age of the Reuben scissors thing my godfather died of AIDS like a really terrible death he was like one of the most important people in my life just like this shining light in my life and he dies of AIDS when I'm seven and I see him go through this horrible death and um my mom and brother are crying on the corner in the floor and I'm like looking at them crying and I'm sad and I'm like I will not be part of that like I will I just like I'm like whatever is going on over there, like I will not be part of. And I remember sitting by myself on the floor, like against my bunk bed, it's being like, I will not cry. Like self, seven years old. Self-preservation. Exactly. It's interesting. Totally like some sort of denial or or this armor. Like 
I see my what my older daughter has traces of that. Yeah. This coldness to prevent herself from getting hurt. Yeah. In these kinds of situations. Yeah. So it's like I feel like where you were in your recovery at that point, it's like it's like people who go to meetings or something but aren't in it in it. And like I don't think you get in it and really in it in it until you're like, I need it. Like, and then I'm just going to do it. Right. And then you're still not in it. Yeah. You're only in it once something happens. Like, I don't even know how you get into it. Like, I don't know the difference between where you are and not being in it to when you do get in it. Like, that's the weirdest it's thing. It's like that moment of grace. I love listening to that in like people's. It's weird yeah. though, like where it comes from. You're sober in Manhattan, sober boyfriend, and you're going to meet your sober boyfriend's childhood friend and you decide I'm going to drink. Yeah. Right. So I like go buy like a six pack of beers and drink it before I meet them. And then uh, I don't know if they knew I was like drunk that night, but then the next day I go meet them in Central Park and I'm like, I go from beer to vodka and I end up like not like being catatonic in Central Park with, in the them. Middle of, with them in mm. the middle. And they like called an ambulance and like the ambulance, the had, like right. Have you, you ever seen an for. ambulance have to like pick someone up in Central Park? It's like they got to do all this crazy shit to like not not off the path. No, right. Not, not, can't, can't even imagine. Right. Like, and I don't remember what that's like. But so what ends up happening is that like over the course of seven days, I end up in the hospital six times because like I keep drinking and I keep being unable to like get sober and like the, you know, my rehab counselors like Jamie, like what, like, and then, then this, uh, uh, addiction psychiatrist that I'm seeing like now is like, you know, prescribes me, uh, you know, a, a higher, uh, dose of whatever to help me like taper off of, was I too close? You were too far. Oh, okay. You were like, Really? Yeah, this, this is the good stuff. We, okay. need, we need every bit of it. <laughs> so he like prescribes me something stronger with the intent of like helping me with withdrawal, right? But it's like, I mean, like how fucking irresponsible. You're giving like an active alcoholic who cannot stop drinking something to help them with withdrawal, but like it's, no indication that they're like actually like. It just lets you, it just is so obvious how archaic the the medical world is and how the medical field has no understanding of addiction and, and he's an addiction psychiatrist like he's gone through years and years of like the shrink med school it's like why don't we just give her like the highest dose of benzos and just maybe it'll work out maybe it'll go well with alcohol like <laughs> no it's it is it is it's crazy it's, it's like there, there's just weird things in our world where we're not protected at all yeah so, yeah. so he gives you some crazy high octane benzo. Yes. So then I'm like drinking vodka on this benzo, which and is like snorting which, Adderall. Okay. So it's like all three things. It's all right? happening. Yeah, it's all happening. So I, I keep ending up in the hospital, and like you know, like the the sober community that I've developed is like, what the fuck, Janie? And like, you know, my parents are like, what happened? And and then it's sort of like the only option is rehab, like inpatient rehab. So now this, you know, sober boyfriend is like literally flying me. Like, I'm like, I'm not going to get on the plane without him. I don't think I actually said that, but that was like, everybody knew that. So it's like, he's this poor guy who's like, I don't know, 26, 27, like I'm 24. He's like two years older than me is like, you know, and he has his like four months sober and he's like flying me to Minnesota. You go to Hazelden. To go to Hazelden. Wow. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, in inpatient and how's Hazelden? Beautiful, like amazing. Like it is like summer camp. It right. is, it is like, you know, and I, I wasn't, the thing is too, is like, I wasn't much of a cigarette smoker. I picked up cigarette smoking at Hazelden cause it's a rehab that allows you to smoke and everybody else is smoking. And I'm like, I got to fit in. Sure. Like I'm going to smoke. Nothing else to do. Might Nothing well, else might to well do. Smoke. But it is beautiful. So I'm like, you know, every morning smoking cigarettes outside with deer scampering. It was June. It was beautiful. I had terrible allergies and they like would not prescribe me more allergy medicine. So I'm sneezing all the time. Everybody's mad at me cause I like cannot stop sneezing, but still it's like the best 30 days of my life. Like I feel a, like that's the least compassionate thing in the world is when people, my wife gets so angry at me when I have allergies. Sneeze? Oh yeah. my God. It's like, I'm dying over here. I know people are like, Janie, stop sneezing. And I'm like, I can't, I, I can't. would if I could. I would love to not <laughs> like, sneeze Like I would right love now. to not sneeze. Right. So, um, 
so I'm, you know, at Hazelden and I'm still not able to, and I'm like, oh, I'm never going to drink again. This is, and I'd never had women, fr- like female friends. Like I'd had female friends, but I'd, all my closest friends had always been guys. And now I'm like developing a relationship with women and being like, oh, I've been hiding behind like relationships with men. And, you know, I'm just like discovering all this stuff about me. And I'm, uh, but I'm still like not quite able to like, you know, I remember someone being like, okay, you need to like start doing this recovery work and me being like, yeah, I've already done it. And then being like, what are you talking about? Like you're here with like three days sober. Like you clearly haven't done that work properly, you know? And why do you think, like, what do you think crosses your, your brain when you can say I did it and you haven't done it? I think it's... Is it like a little kid saying, I know, I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like I need to be... I need to be... Um, just defiant. Defiant. And not even like... I'm not a defiant person by nature, but I think it's just like uh, shame at not... Like it's like I want to know everything. I want to like not admit that like I'm struggling. Like I think it goes back to that stoicism thing. It's like, yeah, I've, I've, I've totally. done it. Like I, I know. I know what I'm supposed to do. Like you don't need to tell me what I'm supposed to do. Because also Hazelden, it, to me, I've always imagined it's like the Mount Olympus of rehabs. Yes. It's like every standard is set there. Yes. And like everybody gets, you know, it's got a crazy success rate and they write all, half the literature that yep. we get. And it's, yep. like, right, I get and it. it's, it's like really is, it's like the Mecca of like recovery. Like it's, it's beautiful. Like it's like, they're not just like, you know, they're not, they're like, not fucking around. They're not at popping pills and hoping that you just like remain sedate. Like they are like, this is what we do. This is how we do it. This is the time you wake up. This is where you're going to be. And if you're not there, like we're going to, we're going to know why. Um, and, and they're helping you set these habits, right? Like these good eating habits, these good, like, you know, make your bed in the morning habits, like these like life habits, laugh, life habits and, and spiritual habits. And like, you know, just like, like everything about it is like health in every, like from the inside out. Right. And, um, and I'm like understanding that and I'm like buying it, but I'm like not all in, you know? Well, you're still young. You're not done. You know, it's just, but I think I'm done. Like, that's, what's wild is that like, I, like when I was an outpatient, when I, like, I'm never going to drink again. Like, and I remember being people being like, don't say, don't, nothing's guaranteed. Don't say that. And me being like, no, like I'm never drinking again. Like you don't understand. You were all in and and believed it. Cause why not? Yeah. But like still like, I'm not able to like the idea of, you know, people seeing the innermost me was like not an option. And I didn't quite understand that, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, you can like have that stuff and you can like, I understand in theory, like, you know, I'm supposed to be honest and authentic and like reach for the real Janie, but like, you're not doing, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Like nobody's ever going to see the real Janie. Like why would anybody, why would I ever let anyone see that? Like you don't want to see that. Like I've been trying to be someone else for the past 24 years so that you don't have to see the real me and you won't like the real me if you see it. So and it's conditioned that your, your response is a conditioned response. It wasn't like a chosen response really. No, it was, it was just like, uh, just, it was intuitive. You see, know? I feel like when I would go to rehab, my response was, I don't, I'm not doing this. Yeah. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I got this or I'm never, I was like, I'm not going to be sober at all. Yeah. But I, I, but I didn't tell anybody that either. I just knew that I wasn't. Interesting. And like either way, it doesn't yeah. really help anybody. So why were you there? I, cause just I, to take a break. I couldn't afford to use, I wanted to want to yeah. get sober, but I didn't but want weren't. it. I yeah. couldn't click into it. Yeah. I wanted to want to be sober. Yeah. I wanted to not be addicted to, you know, like, and also with, with my addiction, when I couldn't afford it, I would just be sick. Mm. And then maybe I'd get a little bit of money and then I'd be sick. And it was just bad. Like there was yeah. no life. And, yeah. and and then my parents found out and they were like, like they, they kind of were out. They just stayed out of it until yeah. it was so bad that they sent me to a spot in Florida. Mm. And I went there, and then I still didn't get out of it, though. I was there, and I, and I had kind of the opposite response, which was, I'm not going to really do this. Yeah. I, I, I was like, I'm not really going to do this. I, I, I think my response was, I can smoke weed again. Okay. That oh, was, my, interesting. Res- that was okay. my response. But it wasn't like I can do harder stuff again it was just like it was i don't want to do harder stuff i just want to smoke weed like sobriety light it wasn't it was just like i didn't want to be 
I, I wanted right. to be a stoner and I wasn't prepared to not be one. Got it. That makes, that makes sense though to me. Like it, like it makes sense why. Yeah. Cause I probably felt the same way in some regard. But it's like, because you probably couldn't really swallow that you were like a leaving Las Vegas level yeah. alcoholic. <laughs> and you're like, I can just drink. Yeah. Like Jesus. maybe like there was those two beliefs. So yeah. how long were you in Hazelden for? So I was in Hazelden for 30 days. And they were like, okay, so we think you should go to a sober, like a St. Paul in Minneapolis is like the sober yeah. mecca of yeah. the world, right? It's like so many halfway houses, such a huge recovery community. And they're like, we think that you should go to this young person's like house for three, four, five, six months in St. Paul. And there's great state like programs. Exactly. And I'm just like, absolutely not. Like I have too much to lose, you know? And they're like, what do you have to lose? And I'm like, I am in this relationship. Like, you know, I got my nanny job and they're like, you don't have your nanny job anymore. And I'm like, yeah, but like, you know, there's so many. And like, I'm just like, like, I can't be here. I can't be I'm not here. Do, I need like, to drink I, I in St. Paul, like Minnesota. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like I did four years in Michigan. Right. Like there's no way I'm doing you know, there's no way I'm letting you like alter my life and, and spend any amount of time in the Midwest. And so, but I like still fully, I'm like, it's fine. I have a sponsor back home. Like I have a home group. Like I have like, you know, I've whatever, like I, I got this stuff. Like I'm, I'm gonna, like, I'm going to be fine. And I, um, you know, get on the plane just like fully being like, I'm, I'm fine. And there's this woman at the, like, I'm at like a, I'm at a restaurant you know, like an airport restaurant and this woman's like, oh, let me buy like, and I'm like looking at her. I'm like, she's such an alcoholic. Like she's so ridiculous. She's so out of control. It's like 10 a.m. in the morning. Like she's taking shots of Jaeger and she looks at me and she's like, you want a shot of Jaeger? And I'm like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Jaeger, like Jaeger was one of those things where I was like, why do frat boys do Jaeger? It's only 17% alcohol. Like, do they know like that that's not how you get drunk? But like this lady is like, offering me a shot of Jaeger and I'm like absolutely on your way home from Hazel on my way home from Hazel mm-hmm. and then like I have a beer to chase that and it's fine like I go back I'm like back in my relationship I still have these friends who are sober like I'm trying to live this sober life and um, I'm like sneaking alcohol but like really light and I, I'm just like nobody really knows like and and somebody will be like oh you kind of smell like beer and I'll be like oh I you know I had Somebody sourdough spilled bread it, somebody uh, spilled earlier, it like, you yeah, know, sourdough bread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, but so I'm like really, you know, and of course that doesn't last long. And then, um, was that really a line when you smelled like beer? So you had eaten sourdough bread. I don't know. Probably. That's great. That's yeah, great. <laughs> probably. I'm, I'm smart like yes, that. Very clever. Um, so it's like about a, a month or two months like that. It's like, and it's like a pretty good summer. You know, but I'm like, I'm just like, I'm one foot in and one foot out. And like, I'm not drinking the way I want to drink. And I'm not sober the way I want to be sober. Well, you're not sober. You're drinking yeah. and going to meetings. I'm drinking and going which to meetings. Great. But like drinking you want like the social a life. beer, you want, the, right? you want the social life of recovery. Exactly. Which is really interesting. Exactly. Too. Yeah. And because like now I have friends again. And um, and I just like, I can't do it. And so I end up like, my parents are like, you know, we love you, but it hurts to be around you. Like you can no longer live here. And so I get this like apartment with this girl I met who was supposed to be sober. And then like, neither of us are sober together, but like I'm worse than her. So she kicks me out and I don't have a job. And um, I end up and like nobody, like I can't move in with anybody. Like nobody will have me. So I end up going to uh, like a this like just like really awful like three like I go to another rehab and I go to a you know a million more detoxes and I go to another rehab and uh, the rehab's like okay we're gonna send you like you have nowhere to go like we're gonna have to send you to a, a shelter so I get sent to this shelter. How does that your parents won't let you go home? My parents won't let me go home, which so I wait, understand. Hold, hold like, at, at some point, here's the thing. At some point, I had begged my parents to go into Al-Anon. And why? Because like, I was like, okay, if you're going to have like a, you know, like an addicted daughter, like you should have the tools, you should have the tools. But then meanwhile, it works, right? It works. Like they learn to let go with love. Right. And they learn to protect themselves. And like, it it really worked for them. And, And like, that's, I'm really grateful for that because I probably like wouldn't be alive had it not worked for them. So, you know, I'm 24. I appreciate that. (laughs) 
Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, and, and truly, like, I really truly mean that. Like, I, I cannot imagine like what, like I put my family through, right? Like to see your daughter, like killing herself every day and like not know where she is. Like, it's like, it, it, you know, the shit that I did to them and, you know, and I'm like, it's like, I'm not that person. Right. But like my addiction is like that strong that I am like a hellhole. And they needed it. My, my parents went to families anonymous. Mm. And it was like the end of the end of the road. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was just that. Yeah. And they needed it and it was great for them. And and ultimately it was great for me. But I'm just so shocked because you tell your story, then all of a sudden you say I go to a shelter. Yeah. And like sitting with you, hearing your story, I'm not expecting that. A shelter. Right. Like and, yeah. and how does that become your reality? Where does where does it even come from? Where do you go? And and how much different is your life from every bit of this story to I'm going to a shelter in Manhattan? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like I don't even have an answer to that. It's like I I'll, on my 25th birthday, I'm like checking into rehab in Long Island. Which one? Uh, I don't know. Sea Breeze or, yeah, or something sea, like sea, that. Sea Bridge or some, sea, yeah, I understand. Sea Smoke. Yeah, yeah, sea, sea, sea something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm Seafield. Seafield. Yeah. So and I you know Sea Breeze. A sea Breeze. Sea <laughs> that sounds nicer. Yeah. Um. So I'm, uh, you know, in rehab there and, and my insurance calls, I'm 14 days in and they're like, we, and I, I'm just like bullshitting, right? At this point, I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Fuck you. I've been to Hazleton. Like you are a ghetto piece of shit. Like, nice. you know, like I'm just, and I'm not like angry, right? I'm just like inside like that because like what you see is still how I was when I was like, a, like I still was like, right. You, you were know. just a snob. I right. Mean, right. New York exactly. City snob. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, fuck this. Like you know, I, I know better than you guys. Like I've been in, like, I've been in recovery. Like I've, I, you know, <laughs> I've walked the walk. I've talked like, you know, so I'm, um, basically like my, and, and the counselors don't like me and I'm like, why don't they like me? Like everybody's always liked me. Like I've always been like the model student. Everybody's always liked Janie. Like how come these people don't like Janie? And I, um, you know, have some little friends there and, um, Basically, like, insurance is, like, hey, like, we're not paying for more than 14 days. And, like, the counselors, like, actually are not willing to fight. Like, because there's a lot there's a lot you have to go through. Like, I'm still under 26. So I'm still on my parents, like, pretty good insurance. And, like, they're, like, we've had enough. And the counselors, like, aren't willing to advocate for me. Like, they say they are, they but try. they're they not. They're just, you. like, they why she doesn't you. deserve it, right. you know? Right. So then it's, like, all of a sudden it's, like, hey, by the way, you're leaving tomorrow. And I'm, like, I don't have anywhere to go. Like I thought I had 14 more days to sort this out. And they're like, okay, great. If you have nowhere to go, then we're legally obligated to drop you off at a shelter. So, and they set, they, you know, dropped me off at a shelter and they set Where me, was the shelter? Um, Somewhere in East Harlem. Oh my God. But what ends up happening is that I don't, like they, they dropped me off at a shelter and they're like, we have these appointments. It's like maybe Friday. And they're like, we have these appointments for you. Um, next week for these like government run three quarter houses that you can show up to, you know, and live in. Get a bed. Yeah, exactly. And so they dropped me off like outside this shelter and I don't go in. And I like had this friend who wasn't who I met when I was sober, who was also not sober. And I call him and I'm like, oh, it's my birthday. And like, you know, I basically go like a week weekend long blackout with him. He ends up kicking me out at the end of the weekend because his dealer who he's sleeping with is coming over so I can't be there and so you know I end up I don't know if you remember what I did that night but maybe like sleep on the subway or something end up showing up at this appointment on Monday and end up in uh, Phoenix house do you remember Phoenix house yeah. I think they're still around yeah. so I end up in Phoenix house and somehow like they have like all these crazy like like um you know hardcore six month eight month like therapeutic Right. Uh, what are they called? Not TC. even therapeutic communities, yeah. like the the like lockdown ones, right. right? Everybody else in this waiting room is getting sent to these lockdown ones. And somehow like I come in and I'm like somehow get them to place me in the aftercare, which is like a therapeutic community on the Upper West Side. And I'm like, this is perfect for me. Like I somehow like I'm so manipulative. I'm so smooth. I'm so good that I let them like, like convince them, don't send me to like rehab jail, like send me to rehab like haven social, you know social exactly life. right so they send me to this uh tc on 74th 
on the Upper West Side. I'm like, this is great. I'm like back on the Upper West Side. Like I'm not paying rent, you know, I'm on, you know, Medicaid, whatever. Right, right. And so, uh, and it's like. You're thinking like an institutional <laughs> right? person in New York City. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so quick, right? Yeah. And, and it's like all these people who were like, you know, it's, it's mostly men. It's all these people who were like, who are uh, avoiding prison sentences and are there instead. And then it's me. And everybody's like, how are you here? Even the counselors are like, what are you doing here? What's a nice girl like you doing here? Yeah, I'm and still, I'm like, I'm, I'm still, different. I've just you heard know? your whole story and I'm still trying to piece it together. Right, exactly. <laughs> and it's like, and so like I have that unique, like, what, right. do, they, what do they call it? Terminal uniqueness. Terminal uniqueness. And people are actually telling me I'm terminally unique. Right. They're like, what are you talking about? You're, you're like not 25. like 25. Yeah. yeah, you're 25. Like the, the, the patients you're and the You're an adorable white girl. Exactly. What are you doing yes. here? And you heard my reaction. You're like, I went to a shelter in East Harlem. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> right, right. What's she doing there? Yeah, I'll save her. Yeah. You know? And so I'm like, I'm there and I'm just like hopping around, like doing whatever the fuck I want. And, um, and getting upset when like I break a rule and it's, and you get hot or something. Yeah. Right. And so what ends up happening is I go out drinking one night and I had done that before, right. I had drank there and I had, and I was like, it's fine because like the urine tests, like they're not testing for alcohol, they're testing for drugs. And basically like this counselor who like loves me is like, I'm giving everybody a breathalyzer tonight. And so mm. instead of like taking the breathalyzer, he, did you think he knew? I don't even know. Like, I don't think he did. Cause I'd been drinking plenty before. I think it was just like the Saturday night breathalyzer night. And, and this guy was sober. Um, and I end up basically like, instead of being like, yeah, let me take the breathalyzer and just like admit that I drank and admit that I'm wrong. And like, what can I do to amend this situation? I'm like, Oh, I guess I got to leave right now. Right. And so, and so I was like, okay, let me go to the bathroom. And I just like leave and I leave and all my stoicism, clothing there. I stoicism leave, is yes, on display. I leave like everything there. So what happens to you? So it's May of tw- uh, 2013 and I'm sort of like at the, like, I really have no more, like, I don't know, last house on the blocks. Like I, I like just have no more like, um, And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like some, I don't know, two or three week blackout. Uh, And I would really like be in blackouts for like two or three weeks and just like wake up in like really scary, like strange places. And um, I like leave the hospital like one morning and I'm like, I really have no place left to go. And I like call this guy and I'm like, and I can't like sit in a McDonald's like passed out. That dude. Yeah. So I call this guy who's like, like at this point, just like not willing to talk to me. And I'm like, I need to talk to you. And it's like 6am and we're like out on, you know, he's like, you can't come into my apartment. So he comes outside and I just like tell him the truth. And he's like, you know, and he's like mad, but like, he's not more mad than he was yesterday. Cause now I'm actually telling him the truth. And he's been like, he knows I haven't been telling him the truth. And he's like, okay, like, like, what's next? And I'm like, I need to go back to inpatient. And he's like, okay. And like, you know, I don't remember if he took me to the, the now St. Luke's is down on, they've moved the addiction center from 114th to 57th street. And so somehow I end up there and they're like, we don't have a bed. And I'm like, I need a bed. I'll do like, I'm begging for my life. I'm like, I will do anything for a bed. Like somehow I manage, like I stay there maybe 24 hours, like in their waiting room and like manage to like finagle a bed and I'm in like really bad. So it's like now the rehab and the detox are together. So it's like, I'm on, I don't know. What's the thing that they give you for, um, interferon, no. su- sublocade, Vivitrol. No, what's it's for alcohol. Yeah. Isn't it? Oh, it's, um, ant abuse. No, it's the one, it's like a minor grade, whatever. It doesn't matter to like, uh, bring you out of, cause like alcohol withdrawal is really dangerous. Right. And so it's oh, like oh, phenobarbital. No. Oh, um, uh, you're like it? listening to all the drugs. Clonidine? Like, something like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that was a lot of uh, and none of them were the right. No, drug. none of them are That's the right so one. Sad. I guess like different addictions. Well, different, but I should, different know, I should know this stuff by now. But anyway, um, it's going to come to me. But so, so I'm there and I'm just like in this haze and I'd been to rehab and detox so many times before, but it had never been this bad. And it's really like three or four days where I'm just like, I had seen people like this, like on the ward, but I'm having like, uh, 
you know, like hallucinations and just like, I'm like in bad shape and I kind of come out of it and it's like the same shit again for me. I'm like, you know, fuck these people. Like, you know, and, and there was this, um, which still exists. There's this halfway house on the Upper West Side where they have, instead of like a million bunk beds in a room, they're single rooms and it's on 102nd Street. And I'm like, that's the place I'm going to go. Like this is the like crumb de la crumb of government run, you know, that's or the nice Medicaid. Spot, right. Yeah, exactly. And like they like through these, you know, two or three weeks that ensue, and and it's like the sister, it's like connected these, to this, Saint it's Luke's. It's connected to Saint Luke's, and I'm like, that's where I'm going to go. And they just keep maintaining like that is not where you're going. And I'm like, yeah, like there will be a bed by the time I leave. And it's just like whether or not, I don't even know if like they were like, fuck this girl. She's not getting one of those beds. She doesn't really want it. Or if there really wasn't a bed, like I will never know. But they are like, you are not ending up here. So I end up like it's the same story as the last rehab where it's like I end up like just, you know, like after 21 days, insurance is like, yep, we've had enough. I'm on Medicaid at this point. Um, and Medicaid's like, yeah, that, that's it. So I got sent to, do you remember Narco Freedom? I remember the names, the word Narco Freedom. So Narco Freedom in 2015 got like uh, federal charges, like criminal charges brought against them in 2015 from the federal government for like just like total misuse of Medicaid funds for basically like putting addicts through like this, like through the ringer and not actually providing them services. And the CEOs of Narco Freedom are like now in jail for like taking that Medicaid money and buying private jets. So just like this terrible place, right? So I get sent to this three quarter house in the Bronx, this Narco Freedom three quarter house in the South Bronx. And it's like, you know, five stories, like rickety, like all women, linoleum floors, rats, like actual physical rats in the space, um, bunk beds along the walls. And I'm like, what the fuck has happened? This is, like, it seems like you're in the right place, though. Right. So <laughs> it I'm like, really what does. the fuck At has happened? At this point, it's, it seems yeah. like you're in the right place. And I'm like, you know, if I had a safe place to get sober, I would be sober. Like, meanwhile, I'd had so many safe places to get sober. So I'm there for two or three weeks. And I start going back to, to like, recovery meetings. And um, and I start, like, you know, and I'd been going for, for the past year, but I'd been drinking in them. And I just, like, you know, and I... Um, sort of start to hear like that recovery message, but I end up having to go on like one more, you know, two week long blackout. And I come out of this blackout and it's like June and it's rainy and I'm soaking wet. And I like, you know, I've been wearing the same clothing for days and I stink. And I call this guy who I knew was sober, like a different guy who was like creepy and sketch as hell. And he like picks me up from outside the hospital. I I go across the street to Dwayne Reed. I leave the hospital. I go across the street to to Dwayne Reed, I steal a beer because I'm like, and this is June 15th, 2013, and I steal a beer. It's 5.30 a.m. because I'm like, I'm going to have withdrawal. So I chug the beer. I call this. I don't even call this guy because I don't have a phone. I had like an Obama phone, yeah, like yeah, a track yeah, phone that yeah. I had lost. And so I like go to the public library, which was like my move when I had lost my phone was to go to the public library and like message someone on Gchat so I like messaged this guy on Gchat and then like somehow he's like, okay, I like I'll come and get you. And he's this like creepy ass sketchy, like one of those like sober dudes who's like, just like not <laughs> actually sober, just like so creepy. He takes me to a hotel and he ends up and we had like, you know, hooked up before and he like, is like, oh, I can get you alcohol to help you with the, with the with you the know, DT whatever, whatever, which I'm like, nope. And he's, you know, he's like hitting on me all weekend. And I'm like, nope, like I'm just here to like, literally like I'm just there to like throw up and just be like, you know, try to get my shit together without going back to detox. And so I end up like pushing this guy away all weekend. Okay. This was very important moment. Okay. We're okay. You're in this horrible hotel with this really creepy guy who's hitting on you and you refuse to uh, succumb to his will because you're just trying to be there. Yes. Yes. So I'm, sure I'm like, he's thrilled. At, right. And, and like, <laughs> it's like this poor guy. I'm like, are you the devil or are you the angel? Cause he actually like did like, you know, is, is somewhat he's responsible probably, right. or it he's was probably a, both. Yes. Right. So exactly. So, and my, my clothing stinks and like, there's a little dishwasher. So we wash the, my clothing in, in the dishwasher and, um, and for two days and two nights I'm there and I'm like refusing alcohol and I'm refusing to sleep with him and like I'm you know I'm just like like there's something different and and on the second or third day like I leave 
and I um, call my mom and I'm like, I can't, um, like I, I have to sort some stuff out with, uh, with this three quarter house. Like, can I come stay with you for a night? And she's like, and I hadn't been allowed in my parents' house for like, I don't know, months and months. And she's like, yes. Like there's something like noticeably different about me. And she's like, yes. And my god sister was How much there. time did you have at that time? Two days. Two days. And she, did you tell her about anything you had been through? I told her some truth. I like was like, I got like, I, there's something like, I'm not at this halfway house. I said I was, I'm at a, at this point, actually they had known I wasn't at, I'd been lying about Did being, they know that you had been homeless? I don't think so. Did they know that you were smoking crack in SROs? Definitely not. And I hope they do not listen to this. Oh, I'm sure they're definite listeners to the show. Oh so they don't know any of this at all? They, no, nobody listens to this stupid I show. I mean, well, well, the thing... <laughs> don't, don't, don't... Actually, you people do listen. Some people I've looked do. at your reviews on iTunes and Spotify. Well, there's some reviews. There's a lot of reviews. Yes. Anyway, so you didn't tell your mother... You still haven't told your mother. Well, so they've heard... You know, they... they I use the word homeless and press, right? And so I always figured that. you weren't really homeless. You yeah, were just one of these of couch surfing homeless a people. A lot of people think that. All yeah. these, these uh, what's the word I'm looking for? These, fan, the, these, uh, you know, people claim homelessness all the time. Yeah. When I did a thing with the New York Times, they like had to like verify that How I was homeless like homeless. Were you? Yeah. Because the the editor was like, I don't want to write that she's homeless, and the writer was like, but doesn't this qualify as homeless? No, it qualifies. There's yeah. so many people who come on and claim homelessness. And but it was really, like, they were like on their father's couch Yeah, they're or at something. their friend's house. Yeah. It's like, that's not fucking homeless. No. You're like Sleeping on, on the, the train subway. smoking yeah. crack. Literally a couple nights I slept in the bushes. And I'm telling uh. you this before we get to the good part. Yeah. This whole time, I was like, she's going to be at her friend's house. She In my head, I'm like, she's not really, she didn't really get homeless. Yeah. That's why I didn't yeah. start in the beginning to say you were homeless. Yeah. But look at this. Look you, at this. this <laughs> it's, it's real. Your story's f***ed <laughs> up. Yeah. It's f***ed up. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's f***ed <laughs> up. You know, there's, you. I, I go to a meeting with the old time guy. He's like probably 75 and he has yeah. 30 years. And his story is like your story. Really? He was terrible. He's just like, don't I, see it. It's like a train coming yeah, out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what does your mother do? So, so she says, okay. And, and like my, and my dad, who was like my best friend and, and I had destroyed that relationship. Like I really, like he was like my best friend growing up and I, like, I really like, it still hurts me to think about it. Um, but he, you know, they, they let me come stay with them for the night and it's actually my dad's birthday or no, it was father's day. It was mm. Sunday and it was father's day and they let me stay and, yes, and they're Janie, happy to see me. This is the best father's day present anybody could ever give me. I think they don't even like, they, I, I don't even, I mean, I like don't even think I said it was father's day. Cause it was like, so just like mortifying that it was like, it's one of those things though. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, and, and I actually ended up, it must've been the day before father's day because I ended up having a year sober on father's day, which is Good beautiful deal. and crazy. Yeah. Um, so, so they let me stay and it's like a, it's a good night. We go out to dinner with my God sister. Like I sleep on the floor. Um, and the next day I'm like, okay, like my mantra now is like, do the next right thing, do the next right thing, do the next right thing. And like, I don't quite know what that is, but I'm like, just like, okay, like let's like, I, for my whole life, right. I'm 25 years old for my whole life. It's like I am, in order to avoid discomfort, I am like banning whatever that thing caused discomfort from my life. So it's like the pattern usually would be like, okay, like I left narco freedom in the middle of the night, like against medical advice. And so I will never go back to narco freedom. But instead on like June 17th or whatever this is, I'm like, okay, let me call narco freedom and see if they still have my stop and see if my bed is still secure. So it's like really like, it's like I'm, I'm looking like, fear in the eye and facing it and they're like yep come on back you know and so I come back and they put me in a different room and it's a worse room right and I have lost like I don't have my track Obama phone anymore I don't have whatever the one thing that I've managed to hold on to in this two-week blackout is a notebook that's blank with that I'd written handwritten the serenity prayer on the front I thought I was going to have the, the apple pie cookie recipe. Right, that would be great. <laughs> I should All tell I that story. One yeah, notebook all I had was full, this recipe yeah, full of that cookies. I wrote in a blackout. Yeah, in a blackout. That, that's, that's the new story. So, right, that's good. Thank you. Um, so it has the serenity brand in the front, and then it has a bunch of women's phone numbers in the back. And I 
there's this woman who I'm like, she's so magical. She's so beautiful. Like there's no way she'll ever want to like mentor me through life. But I'm like, fuck it. Like I'm going to call her. And I I call her from a pay phone and she's like, let me meet you for coffee. And so I meet her for coffee. And that's like the beginning of like my journey. Like that's like at that point I had maybe six days sober and it's like me like, and I had, you know, in, in that five days before calling her and like literally she like, like she had like a big job and I called her probably like 3 PM on a Friday and she had like dropped everything and met me by four 30. And, um, and in that four days I had literally like, I don't even think I had been back to like a recovery meeting, but I had just been like, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other to like take the next right action to get my life in an order where I can like actually face like being sober. And, um, so I'm, you know, like got my Medicaid back on track. I'm, I'm doing all the appointments that, you know, is required and narco freedom. And this should be like a documentary someday, but it's like what they do is they like send you, it's like, you're, it's impossible to get services. You have your shitty bunk bed in the rat house, but like they send you to this counselor and then this counselor sends you to this counselor and you go like further and further, deeper and deeper into the Bronx. And then you're in Brooklyn and then you're back in the Bronx and it's like one appointment after the other. But I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. Like, I'm just going to do it. I had nothing else to do. I'm like, I'm just going to do it. And none of this is yielding like any results except me like putting one foot in front of the other. Right. And hours and And days, Yes, yes. you know, whatever. (laughs) It's putting a little bit of time together. Right. Exactly. And, and it's just like, and I'm literally like, I'm just so afraid all the time. And I'm so like, I can't look people in the eyes and I'm just like, so like fucked up. I'm just so ashamed of who I've become, but I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Like I'm fighting for my life. And I, you know, start going back to meetings and I meet this woman and it's like, I just like, I have that gift of desperation that I've never had before. And I'm like, I am willing to do anything that you tell me to do. Like I will do anything and I do anything. And I get a job, uh, you know, I'm looking on Craigslist and uh, trying to find any job, right? And I, there's this job, it's like such a weird like advertisement. It's like vegetarians only. I'm not a vegetarian. Vegetarians only, um, you know, apartment in the East Village, no pay, but, you know, apartment for free. And I go to this like job interview and it's like this weird ass hippie woman who's like the actual super, but she wants to live in the unfinished basement and give the like cute East Village apartment to someone to do the actual super work. And so I end up like getting this job and I remember like getting the keys and I like, it was like this moment of pride. Like I'd never had, I'd never had a key that was my own, right? Like I'd had a key to the college apartment. I had a key to my parents' house. Like, and I remember like going into a a meeting and like putting the key down on the chair to save my seat and like going out and smoking a cigarette and being like, this is like the most proud I've ever felt in my life. Right. And then I like learned what gratitude is. Like, I think like I had never heard the word gratitude. Like I think in 25 years, I had never like heard the word gratitude or understood that that was something that you could obtain or practice. And I remember like, you know, I had to wake up at like four every morning and, and like sweep the streets and take out the garbage in the East village. And I remember like literally rats running across my feet and me being like, I can't believe this is my life. Like it's so beautiful. You are now very comfortable with rats. Right. I was now so good. (laughs) Exactly. And I just like, I'm like, like, I'm like, I'm so blessed. Like, I'm so blessed, like so happy to do this job, right? If you had told me like two years before that I'd be a super, I'd be like, no, I'm gonna fucking win an Oscar. Like, and and here I'm just like so happy to to be. That's crazy. And how long had you had, did you do that one for? I did that till I was about a, a little over a year sober. And then it, like I reached a point, a breaking point where I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And, and for me, the first year, the first year sober was like, I, I didn't know how to live. Like I had no tools. Like I wasn't born with any social or like actual like life tools. Like I didn't know how to pay a bill. I didn't know how to save money. I didn't know how to like, my idea is like, okay, my phone gets shut off. Let me get a new plan. Like not let me pay the back phone bill. Opening mail, answering the phone. Like we're all like just so terrifying. And so my first year was really about just like, okay, like let me like do recovery things, right? Go to many meetings a day and let me like learn how to just like, be a person and I really had trouble connecting with people. Like I was like, uh, especially in the recovery community, I was like, everybody is so much better than me. Everybody's so much. Well, cause you had fucked it up so many times and you had thought you knew it all. And then yeah. finally you were in a position to actually learn cause you knew that you couldn't go in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. When did you, when did the dream of, of Janie's 
life changing baked goods hey. come to pass? Um, uh, so baking my first year sober was like the only way I could connect with people. And it was something I would hide behind. Like I'm such a people pleaser. Food is love. Right. So it was like I could afford to, um, and, and by that point I had a job making like $145 a week working, picking up a little girl after school. And so I was like making $145 a week, had my rent paid. Right. And so would that like, you know, $145 a week seemed like so much at that point. And I was like, okay, like I have nothing to contribute to the world. Um, but I love baking and I really needed an artistic outlet. And so I like started baking from my little East village apartment with the shower, the supers apartment, the supers apartment. I had the shower in the bathroom there or in the kitchen. Yeah. There was no counter space. Um, but I started baking there and I would bring baked goods. Would you cover the tub with the counter and, and use that? It was actually, there was no tub. There was like shower, a shower. That's rare. Shower yeah, in the kitchen. That's yeah. With fun. a shower curtain. Yeah. Serious. Yeah. So I would like bake on the table or on the stove. Um, and I would bring baked goods everywhere. And it was like everywhere I went, I would like show up with brownies or cookies or Were cake. you thinking entrepreneurially no, or not were you at just all. thinking like I, I was make like, great this is cookies. keeping me alive. It was meditative, right? And like the thing is is that like my life was so out of control and, and it's such like a, a scientific process and you have to take one step after another and do the next right action or else like it's gonna get fucked wow, up. Wow, you re- this is really Something. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So, and then, like, when do you start selling the cookies? So, uh, two and a half years in, I like reached this breaking point where I'm like, okay, I'm 27, almost 28. Like, I know how to stay sober. Like, I don't want to drink. Um, my life's kind of together, but like, fuck this. Like, if this is what, like, I'm starting to feel like depressed. Burnt out. And I'm starting to feel anxious. Right. And I'm like, if I'm going to stay sober, like, I, I can't keep doing what I'm doing because. Like it's not enough anymore. Your brain needed a challenge and you needed to have pride. And I needed to not be a nanny. Right. And and everybody in my life is like, oh, you should be a teacher. And I'm like, I don't want to be a teacher. Like I, I don't, like you're so good with kids. Um, and so a friend of mine um, sort of saw that potential in me and saw that I was like, just like, you know, still like I'm still so paralyzed with fear. I'm still unable to express any feelings. And she was having a huge are you okay yeah okay look you looked like uh, no i'm good um so she's having this huge event and uh she reaches out to me and is like can i purchase a cake from you and that was the first it was the first one who was she she's uh uh one of my best friends now but how did she know to buy a cake from you because she had seen me she had seen me bring like to wear though, like a party or something. She like, had seen me, yeah, it's at sober events, and she you know, was sober. Yes, and she like you know was just like I want to support this. I want to support this, this. artisanal sober exactly. baker. Yep, and um, and so like that was like oh someone's willing to put money into this, and it was like sort of that first inkling, and Thanksgiving was right after, and I was like okay, let me bake pies, bake pies, yeah. And so, on, you know, Facebook and through word of mouth, and I ended up selling like dozens, dozens of pies. And so for the next two years, it was like, okay, let me keep staying sober. Let me keep nannying and let me try to build this business on the side. And so I like really put in the legwork from year two to four sober, really put in the legwork of like how to actually build a business while like still paying my bills and, and you know, like living in recovery and, and continuing to grow as a I, like a human. And when does the pie crust cookie creation start? Yeah, so 2017. Um, so I started the business end of 2015. So I must have had two and a half years sober. And then I invented the pie crust cookie beginning of 2017. And it was like the first, like by that point I had like mentorship in the industry and like um, I'm at like a food incubator program and um, I like won this uh, scholarship from Pepsi from from Stacy's Pita Chips to go to this culinary entrepreneurship program, and it was the first time I told my story. Like I, the the scholarship application for this, it was like this amazing grant for women in the food industry, and I was like, I don't deserve this grant. Like I'll never get this grant. And the question on the essay application was what's the biggest thing you've overcome in your life or the hardest challenge you've overcome in your life? And I'm thinking everything else. I'm like, oh, I've had eating disorders. Oh, I've like, 
you know, I have ulcerative colitis and autoimmune just like I'm thinking of like literally every other thing, like besides the fact that you're like besides, the worst alcoholic exactly, in the history of the upper exactly, West Side. Exactly. And so then I'm like, fuck it. And I like, I'm like, I'm going to write about that. And I hand in the application and I'm like, go back and forth between like, of course they'd accept me. Why wouldn't they accept me? And being like, this is like, I'm such a piece of shit. Like, I can't believe I thought that I could tell this story and get away with it. Like, and I go back and forth and the, you know, I'm supposed to hear by August 1st or something and, you know, weeks pass and I don't hear and I'm like, I didn't get it. Like, I'm the biggest piece of shit. Like, how dare I think that I could like be something. And, um, and I get a call at the end of August and they're like, we're so sorry. We've had like thousands and thousands of applications that we had to weed through. And like, we want to offer you this scholarship. And it was like the first time I was like, oh, maybe my story like is okay. You know, and maybe like it can be part of who I am as a businesswoman. And maybe like that can provide hope and inspiration to other people. So at that same time, I invented the pie crust cookie. I'm in this culinary program at the end of it, we're presenting our like business plans in front of this panel of like top industry experts. And I'm like, I don't have a business plan. I don't know my numbers. Like, I don't know why I was in this class. So I have this cookie and I have my story. And I'm like, let me just present that. Like, I don't need the numbers. Like, But where does the idea come from? Is it like, I like pies, but you can't no, pick one so, up and eat it? Yeah, so my ex would come up with, when I was like working on this business, would come up with all these like crazy ideas. And I'd be like, that doesn't work. Like science doesn't back that. Like baking doesn't, like whatever. And he kept talking about a pie crust cookie. And I'd be like, what is it? And he'd be like, I don't know, but it sounds really good. So I was like, okay, let me figure out what a pie crust cookie is. So then I developed this cookie that's like the perfect bites hand of the pie, held, hand handheld held pie. cookie form. People love cookies. People love not sharing. They love having their own individual item. And so it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank Amazing. You. Thank you. And all I can hope is that the Othello seed has been planted. Yes, right, right. Yes, in yes, the, in the yes. Deep, in the deep. <laughs> Who knows what will it, come years from now? <laughs> <laughs> I'll wake up one night and be like, what was I thinking? Listen. The door is always open. Okay. Your story is incredible. Thank you. Your cookies are incredible. Thank you. Hopefully we can finagle something for DopeyCon. Yeah. Uh, it is your yeah, wedding. It is my wedding. Janie's yeah. getting married uh, on, the, on the same day as DopeyCon. So yeah. it is what it is. I will bother you two weeks before. That's it. And yeah, maybe I next, told you to. And yeah. maybe next year, if not this year. Yeah. But um, thank you so much. Yeah. The story is so fucking crazy. Yeah. And I really appreciate it. All of it. Thank you. And I think also my favorite, I mean, I love this story, but I really love, it's something that me and Chris used to talk about all the time. And it's something that I talk about, which is that your life, your work is probably incredibly useful to your recovery. Yes. And I, and yes. I just want to say like, if anyone out there is really bored, you know, try baking. Yeah. Try, uh, get try, a hobby. Try painting. Get a hobby. You Go never fishing. know what's going to come of it. That Do what is, you love. That's, that, I mean, that, I think that's, I guess I'll end with this is that like I get to wake up being a hundred percent me or at least trying to like obtain, like uh, trying to be a hundred percent the real Janie. And I get to do that in my line of work too. Like I don't have to lie about who I am or what my story is. I get to be like, this is the whole messy real part and it's like helping me and it's helping other people and like take it or leave it. But, but that's what's here. And I spent 25 years like hiding and being someone else because you wouldn't accept me and you wouldn't want to see me. And now it's like, I get to show up and spend the next 25 years being like, take it or leave it. But like, I love me and like, I love what I'm doing. And, and it's like, it, I, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard, uh, I mean, I think that's perfect way to end it. I just heard somebody talk about uh, this musician was talking about this Miles Davis quote and Miles Davis said the hardest thing to do is learn how to play like you. Mm. You know, which yeah. is what you're talking about and yeah. it's what recovery is is basically all yeah. about. So. Yeah, and uh, a counselor in rehab at Hazelden I was like, I just want to find the better Janie. And she was like, stop looking for the better or worse Janie. Just start looking for the real Janie. And it's like, you know, my past 11 years sober has been like in pursuit of that real Janie. Can people order baked goods from you across the country? JanieBakes.com. Janie, three locations in Manhattan. Janie, three locations three in Manhattan. Three locations. JanieBakes.com. Thank you, Janie. Thank You're you. Amazing.